Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, members of the House and Senate and fellow citizens, the Constitution requires me to inform the legislature concerning the condition of the state and to recommend measures in the public interest. And it brings me great satisfaction to report on the promising prospects of our public affairs and to commend the members of the House and Senate for your efforts to make Florida successful. Florida's unemployment rate is near a historic low. We have a triple A credit rating. Florida's public university system is ranked number one in the nation. We're ranked one of the top states in the nation for fiscal health. Florida's crime rate is at an almost 50 year low and we have no state income tax. Now it's said that the only thing certain in life are death and taxes, but I'd like to suggest that we have been just a little asterisk to that statement here in Florida. No, I'm not going to promise we can ever forestall father time, but we can say with certainty that we won't have an income tax here in the state of Florida. or a death tax for that matter. <laughs> now last session was productive on a number of fronts and I want to thank Speaker Jose Oliva and President Bill Galvano for their strong and dedicated leadership. <laughs> I would also like to recognize our Lieutenant Governor Jeanette Nunez who has led on key issues ranging from healthcare to aerospace. Thank you for your leadership, Jeanette. <laughs> and as the president has already indicated, we are joined here today uh, by a great first lady for the state of Florida and my wife, Casey. Casey has spearheaded her Hope for Healing initiative to tackle problems facing Floridians in the areas of mental health and substance abuse. She is making a difference and she is only just getting started. We are both looking forward to big things in 2020, including a new baby daughter arriving a couple weeks after the session ends. And that will make it three kids ages three years or under running around the governor's mansion chaos will officially reign supreme in our household. And I can't tell you for sure how that chaos might affect any vetoes I might issue, <laughs> but stay tuned. Now in 2019, we took bold steps to expand educational opportunities, protect our environment and natural resources, reform healthcare, invest in infrastructure and bolster public safety, all while reducing taxes and maintaining healthy budget reserves. While we look, should look with favor on these bold beginnings, we have much more to do. For everything, there is a season, and at the start of this new decade, this is Florida's season of opportunity. We have the chance to build on a strong foundation, the chance to face the challenges before us, and the chance to leave a legacy of success that will benefit our people now and in the future. If we work together during our season of opportunity, we can ensure that Florida works for our fellow citizens. Now this will require a lot of toil and sweat, and it will require not just words, but deeds. We can't rest on past accomplishments. Our only easy day was yesterday. Now Florida must remain steadfast in its commitment to low taxes and fiscal responsibility. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit first to count the cost. We, will live in an incre we live in an increasingly mobile and interconnected time. States cannot tax, regulate, and spend with impunity 
without significant negative consequences. Taxpayers flee, businesses relocate, the economic base narrows, and the state inevitably hemorrhages money, rinse, and repeat. According to IRS figures, Florida has led the nation for six consecutive years in the amount of income totaling tens of billions of dollars being brought to our state due to internal migration. People are voting with their feet, and they are leaving states with bad economic climates for the greener economic pastures of the Sunshine State. And we have the good fortune to be attracting investment in business activity and have good potential for further growth in areas such as aerospace, financial services, healthcare, and manufacturing. To realize this potential, Florida needs to tax lightly, spend wisely, and regulate reasonably. Maintaining fiscal health will provide the type of durable foundation required for the expansion of our economic base, which means more opportunities for the citizens of Florida. When I took office last year, I issued a sweeping executive order outlining a bold approach to protecting our natural resources, improving water quality, and restoring the Everglades. And I did so in part because I believe that stewardship of our natural resource, resources is key to our economic well-being. Our water is the foundation of our tourism industry, makes Florida the top fishing and boating destination in the world, and enhances our property values. Now, this vision required a commitment from the legislature, and I want to say you delivered to the tune of more than $625 million to support water resources and Everglades restoration projects. And because, and because Florida showed that it had skin in the game, we were able to get support from the Trump administration for another $200 million for Everglades restoration. <laughs> Ditto getting federal support for raising the Tamiami Trail. Now, key water projects are proceeding apace, including the EAA Reservoir, which many of you worked on, which will be a welcome relief to so many Floridians who have been negatively impacted by things like toxic blue-green algae. Uh, we are even on offense against the epidemic of non-native Burmese pythons that have ravaged the wildlife in the Everglades. We actually have two folks here from Southwest Florida, Jeff and Robbie Robstorf. Uh, they're actually successful bankers, but they also double as python hunters. Where are you guys at? You think, yeah, take a, take a bow. <laughs> now they and others, including more than over 500 people who are registered now for our ongoing python bowl, uh, are helping to protect Florida's native wildlife by removing these voracious predators uh, from the Everglades. Florida is in the process of realizing a vision with respect to our environment and natural resources that's been widely desired but stubbornly elusive. We have strong momentum and we need to keep it going. And I think we can keep it going by addressing three major areas. First, we should fund water resource projects at the $625 million dollar level on a recurring basis for the next three years. This will provide needed certainty for these key initiatives and will help us leverage even more federal support. Second, the legislature should pass the comprehensive water quality legislation uh, that I've proposed. The bill represents the initial recommendations of our Blue Green Algae Task Force that I launched upon taking office. It's based on sound science and provides a roadmap to reducing nutrients in our water. Third, those that spew untreated wastewater into Florida's water bodies need to be deterred from doing so by appropriate penalties. Too many municipalities have failed to invest in needed upgrades to their water infrastructure in part because it's cheaper to violate the law and pay a nominal fine. This is unacceptable and it needs to change. Now we at the state level will also be doing our part to fortify our infrastructure in our areas most vulnerable to increased flooding and rising seas over the coming months, our Division of Emergency Management and Department of Economic Opportunity 
will be distributing more than a billion dollars in mitigation funds to areas impacted by the hurricanes over the last several years. The bottom line is we have a chance to take bold action to make a lasting positive impact upon Florida's environment. Let's seize this opportunity. Now, over the past year, my administration has been focused on education, and for good reason. Low taxes and a healthy business climate are important in attracting investment to Florida, but so too is our ability to produce top flight talent through our colleges and universities, through workforce education opportunities, and through a strong K-12 schools. Florida has the top-ranked public university system in the nation, and we have three universities now in the top 50. The University of Florida is in the top 10, heading for the top five. Florida State is in the top 20, yeah. Florida State's in the top 20, heading for the top 15. <laughs> and USF is in the top 50, heading for the top 25. After watching the game last night, knowing Florida is going to host next year's national championship, I hope that maybe we have a Florida team playing in the national championship again. So there's no question that Florida is cultivating the talent needed to power our economy to new horizons. Let's keep it going, and let's do even better. Traditional four-year universities aren't the only way to acquire advanced knowledge or skills, though, and for many, it's not even the best way. Thanks to the leadership of our Commissioner of Education, Richard Corcoran, we've launched an initiative to make Florida the nation's leader in workforce education by the year 2030. And thanks to your support, we're off to a good start. If you look around the state, vocational education is making a comeback in our high schools. And students in districts such as Miami-Dade can graduate high school with industry certifications in fields like electrical and HVAC. Apprentice programs also offer a great way to equip Floridians with skills that merit gainful employment. It was either Benjamin Franklin or someone or an ancient Confucian philosopher who once said, I was not able to figure out which one said this, but I think the, the, the thought is good. Tell me and I forget. Teach me and I remember. Involve me and I learn. Once Floridians acquire skills, it is important that they be allowed to employ those skills without unnecessary barriers placed in their way by government. Florida's occupational licensing regime too often hinders upward mobility, oftentimes for low-income workers, because so much of the regime is based not on the legitimate goal of protecting public health and safety, but on keeping people out, creating a guild that benefits insiders at the expense of those seeking to enter many times moderate income professions, ranging from hairdressing, to interior design. Our citizens shouldn't need a permission slip from government in order to earn a living. We have a good reform bill in this regard pending before the legislature. It made it to the one yard line last year Let's punch it in the end zone in 2020. Our low-income workers also shouldn't have their wages depressed by cheap foreign labor. Assuring a legal workforce through E-Verify will be good for the rule of law, it will protect taxpayers, and will place an upward pressure on the wages of Floridians who work in blue-collar jobs. We are a state that has an economy, not the other way around. And we need to make sure that our Florida citizens from all walks of life come first. 
Now, our approach to K through 12 education rests on three main components. Number one, recruiting and retaining great teachers in the classroom. Two, promoting educational choice so parents, particularly our low-income parents, can place their child in a good school. And three, measuring results through accountability. Now, I'm recommending that we take the bold step of setting a minimum salary for public school teachers at $47,500. That will bring Florida from the bottom half of states to number two in the nation. This will make it easier for us to get talented college graduates to enter the profession and will help us retain many of the good teachers we have now. Now, my plan will lead to a substantial pay increase for over 100,000 current teachers throughout the state. And we have two of those teachers here in the chamber with us today. Uh, Lindsay Beam is a sixth grade math teacher at Bluntstown Middle School and Melissa Pappas is a teacher at Brookshire Elementary in Orange County who works with autistic students. Both are highly effective, award-winning teachers who will see salary increases of between five and $10,000 under my plan. Thank you for your service. We are also proposing to replace the best and brightest bonus program with a new initiative that will be more equitable and more generous so that we can reward our strong performing teachers and principals. Now, my proposal places an emphasis on bonuses for teachers and principals in Title I schools with bonuses available of up to $7,500 for teachers and up to $10,000 for principals. These initiatives will build on the successes that we enjoyed in 2019. Now, last year, we faced the prospect of thousands of Florida families toiling on waiting lists for, for various scholarship programs that we've supported throughout the state. And standing here last year, I asked you to act, and the legislature delivered. So joining us today are Brittany and Jeremy Wilson. They have a son with unique abilities, Josiah, who is on the wait list for our Gardner Scholarship Program. Stand up and be recognized. There they are. Now, thanks to our work in 2019, last year's wait list was cleared, and the Wilsons were able to get Josiah on a scholarship so that his educational needs can be met. Last year, we also had nearly 13,000 low-income families on the waiting list for a tax credit scholarship. And thanks to the enactment of the new Family Empowerment Scholarship, these families have been liberated from that waiting list. We have in the chamber with us Talitha Edwards, a mother of seven who lives right here in Tal there, so there's her kids right there. <laughs> And because of your efforts, three of her children with her, with her today are now using this new scholarship program. So thank you for stepping up for Talitha and other mothers like her all around the state. And the bottom line is all Florida parents, regardless of income or zip code, should have the ability to choose the best school for their children. Now, this, this choice shouldn't be limited to just scholarship programs. It also includes school choice amongst public schools. Florida has 658 public charter schools serving over 314,000 students 
nearly 70% are Hispanic and African American, and over 50% are from low-income families. Uh, what are the results? Well, based off the 2019 national assessment, the NAEP results, uh, our education uh, department calculated that if Florida's charter school population was its own state, it would rank number two in the nation for fourth grade reading. It would tie for number two in the nation for fourth grade math. It would rank number one in the nation in eighth grade reading, and it would tie for number five in the nation in eighth grade math, showing that when we increase educational choice and provide innovating lear innovative learning opportunities, we can help students reach their full potential. Now, results matter and accountability is needed, uh, but the framework of Common Core uh, was seriously flawed. When even parents with advanced degrees can't understand their kids' math homework, we have a problem that we have to address. Now, Commissioner Corcoran has spent the past year working with stakeholders throughout the state of Florida, parents, teachers, you name it, uh, to develop a superior approach that will focus on strong standards, high quality curriculum, streamlined testing, and a renewed emphasis on American civics. We will be unveiling that whole new approach in the coming days. Uh, but I would like to say just one thing about one of the keys to our replacement for Common Core. Uh, it will be having a renewed emphasis on American civics and understanding the U.S. Constitution. This means understanding the source of our rights. It, understand the th it un means understanding the theory of the Declaration of Independence, understanding the structure of the Constitution, as well as key amendments such as the Bill of Rights, the post-Civil War amendments, and the 19th Amendment. This also uh, means developing an appreciation for how these enduring principles animated key points in American history, such as the fight for independence more than 240 years ago, such as the leadership of President Lincoln during the Civil War, such as the activism of the suffragettes who succeeded in securing voting rights for women, an anniversary we celebrate this year, the defeat of Nazi totalitarianism during World War II, the crusade led by Dr. King for civil rights for African Americans, and the titanic ideological struggle against and eventually defeat of the tyranny represented by Soviet communism. In the final State of the Union address for President Washington, he said a primary object should be the education of our youth and the science of government. In a republic, what species of knowledge can be equally important? And what duty more pressing than communicating it to those who are to be the future guardians of the liberties of the country? To which I respond, amen. Now, speaking of the Constitution, when I became governor, I was charged with filling three vacancies on our Supreme Court here in the state of Florida. Now, in our system of government, courts play an important role, but it's a role that must remain judicial in nature. When courts exercise legislative authority, they pervert the Constitution and undermine the rule of law. I was mindful of choosing justices who understood the proper role the court is to, in Alexander Hamilton's words, exercise neither force nor will, but merely judgment. And I'm pleased to report that the appointments were well received, so much so that two of the three have already been promoted to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit. And they're... <laughs> and they are both with us here today. We have Judges Barbara Lagoa and Judge Robert Luck. Where are they at? There they are.
On behalf of the state of Florida, I want to congratulate you both on your new posts, and I want to wish you continued success. And clearly, they're going to still be doing great things for the people of Florida on the 11th Circuit. And to our remaining justices, don't worry, reinforcements are coming soon. With the Speaker and President leading the way, the 2019 legislative session witnessed major reforms in the area of health care, from expanding access to telehealth to repealing antiquated regulations. Now, one major initiative that the Speaker mentioned in his comments earlier today was to provide access to cheaper prescription drugs by bringing in safe name brand drugs from foreign markets such as Canada. Exact same drug, just a much lower price. Now, this can only be done with federal approval, and I'm happy to report that the Trump administration is moving forward with the applicable regulations. There's still a long way to go, but the fact that we are even discussing this is a major development in this area, and Florida has been the one to lead the way. I'm also happy to report that the work of the legislature in bringing transparency to health care is starting to bear fruit. The patient savings concept enacted last year was based on the idea that reducing health care costs requires one, price transparency, and two, a way for patients who use that information to actually save money. And I'm happy to report that the state of Florida has implemented a patient savings plan for its employees and has already realized millions of dollars of savings. If we can help make this type of plan widely available throughout the state, we could see many millions of dollars in savings for patients, and we need to proceed and get that done. Now, building a culture of life requires us to champion adoption, and Florida is doing much better in this regard. Thanks to the hard work of Secretary Popple and his team at the Department of Children and Families, who made a concerted effort to eliminate barriers for 3,600 children waiting adoption, DCF was able to reduce the number by 32 percent, making more than 1,100 children who were able to find a forever home. And this was done. And this was done using initial, uh, the existing resources, but by identifying efficiencies, engaging in collaboration with partners and stakeholders, and leveraging the best we can those existing resources. We're working hard to make the adoption process as transparent and user-friendly as possible so that every child can find a loving home. And I also hope that the legislature will send me this session the parental consent bill that was debated last year, passed by the House, but not passed by the Senate. <laughs> One other update on last session's good work. The legislation addressing fraud and abuse of assignment of benefits is already producing results. Citizens Insurance has revised its rates because of the impact of the bill, resulting in nearly 44,000 additional policyholders receiving rate decreases. The number of AOB-related lawsuits involving citizens has dropped as well, from over 500 in June of last year to only 148 in December, and early indications are that similar effects are being observed across the private market. Our legal system is supposed to be used for redressing concrete injuries and disputes. It's not a game and shouldn't be used as such. Reforms such as AOB that improve the legal climate here in Florida are most welcome. Now, hurricane recovery has been a priority for my administration. In January of 2019, I asked Director Jared Moskowitz to expedite reimbursements to affected areas uh, of most recent hurricanes, and the agency has distributed more than $1.4 billion to the communities impacted by Michael, Irma, Matthew, and Hermine. 
the legislature also approved an additional $25 million for Hurricane Michael grant recovery program because that was a major storm and deserved a major response. It's been effective. It's allowed our administration to address local needs in a nimble and targeted fashion. We have a couple folks from Northwest Florida here today that we've uh, been willing to and able to help because of your efforts. We have Sheriff Morris Young from Gadsden County. And we have Brian Hughes from the Mexico Beach Fire Department. Come on. Now, we were able to use this program to help Gadsden County uh, plug major budget shortfalls, and our support of the Mexico Beach Fire Department arguably saved it from going out of existence. Um, so this was a major storm. Great progress has been made, but a storm of that magnitude is a long-term effort. So I ask that you re-up this grant program for another year. Now, we came close to getting hit with another major storm, Hurricane Dorian. I was headed for Florida, and the emergency managers throughout the state, from the county level to Jared and his team at the state level, and to our federal partners at FEMA, sprang into action. We were hoping for the best, but we were prepared for the worst. I want to thank everyone involved in the preparation for their efforts. The storm made a 90-degree turn to the north, less than 100 miles from our coast. I've never seen anything like that. I'm just glad that I did make that trip to Israel in May where I was able to pray. Uh, and so I would be remiss if I didn't thank the big man upstairs for any consideration he may have had for us during that close call. When Christopher Columbus set sail in 1492, his ship, the Santa Maria, carried the flag of Queen Isabella. The flag depicted a castle with the words, Ni plus ultra, meaning nothing further, because at that time, Spain was considered the farthest point west in the entire world. Well, when Columbus returned and reported his discoveries he made in America to the queen, she immediately ordered that the flag be changed. The new flag read, plus ultra, meaning more out there. Well, in this season of opportunity, we can say there is more out there to achieve for our state. And there's no reason why we can't seize this moment and deliver for the people of Florida. God bless you and thank you. <laughs>